Welcome back to, oh, I'm Kevin De Bruyne and I'm really good at football. Pathetic. Grow up. The games are coming thick and fast. After Brighton, we potentially have seven games still to go in April and we're a week in already. If Arsenal are to win this title, we're going to need our squad. And against Luton, a number of, quote, fringe players showed that they are more than up for the fight. If you've been watching me for long enough, you'll know my feelings on the first 11 and my thoughts that it doesn't really exist in reality over a season. It's fun to do combined 11s, fun to pick 11s for certain games, but when a pundit says he doesn't know his first 11 in 2024, when criticizing a top coach at a top club nowadays, I do tend to roll my eyes. The players are playing more football than ever, more at risk of fatigue than ever, squads are bigger than ever, more expensive than ever, teams are more scouted and analyzed than ever, the quality is higher than ever. How could you, and if you could, why would you, put out the same 11 every single week for a whole season? Not only that, but under Arteta, we've shown our ability to adapt much more this season. We've adapted structure-wise, but that's also been personnel-wise as we're attempting to play every type of game. Rob Edwards had some brilliant quotes this week about that, saying Arsenal are able to play a physical game, a footballing game, a running game, whatever it is, and you can only do that with a quality squad. So the squad matters more than ever now, and it's about time we had a chat about those who might make the difference in the running. You have your Partey's, your Trossard's, your Tommy Asu's that I think will feature a lot, but I've picked out three that I think have all been slightly forgotten in different ways to different extents and could be huge for us in this run-in if we maximise their qualities. Starting off with Alexander Zinchenko. 9th of April 2023, a year ago on Tuesday, Arsenal were away at Anfield for the infamous 2-2. Zinchenko played 88 minutes that game in his 16th consecutive start in the Premier League. It's tough to get a read on an entire fan base, but if Anfield away was this Tuesday, a year on, I don't think anyone would have Zinchenko in their starting 11. In fact, if everyone was fit, is there an argument to say that Zinchenko would be fourth choice? If Timber's fit and available, I think he starts. Mikel spoke again this week about Timber's qualities and specifically what he can do for us in the final third that's unique in the squad, which we spoke about in this video. Tomiyasu would definitely have started away at Anfield this season up against Salah, where he fit back in December. And Jakob Kivio has been our left back and doing well in arguably the best period of results over a seven or eight game sample in Arsenal's last 15 or so years. He started away at the Etihad with Zinchenko on the bench. So how has that happened? Clearly there are Zinchenko games in this run-in, which we'll come to. But fourth choice, arguably, something's happened. Firstly, I think there's the tactical aspect. When Zinchenko came in, he was the sole reason we could create that 3-2 shape and our build-up to the effect we did, because at the time, he was the only one in our squad who could comfortably step in from fullback. The fullback part is important, because if you do it from there, as opposed to asking your midfielder to step in as a double pivot to create the two, not only can you pull wingers inside more easily and open up passing lanes out wide, it also gives you more flexibility on the timing, as the distances aren't as big for a fullback. It's therefore less taxing for a fullback, as opposed to a left or right eight, having to come up and down all game to be in the pivot. So it's a very effective solution for not all, but a lot of scenarios. And we all know the other benefits of at least having this option and build up from fullback by now. Overloading the opposition midfield or press with theoretically better defenders, different passing angles, you keep opposition players occupied further up the pitch, you get more passing options further up the pitch as you keep a man up there and so on. And Zinchenko's intelligence to know when to step in and when not to brought us so much. Combine that with his quality on the ball and our progressive passing numbers went through the roof when we first did it, adding a whole new dimension to our game and contributing to that incredible start to 22-23. Zinchenko was the guy. I mean, we tried it with others at the time. Kieran Tierney gave it a go, but looked uncomfortable. Others had spells in there last season, but to little effect. But now it's changed. White's found that in his game. We know Timber can do it. Tommy Asu can do it better now. Looking a lot more confident, for example, at Sevilla away on the underlap. From fullback, there's now options. And also, I think our structure has changed, so it doesn't always have to be the fullback anymore. It just depends on the scenario and how we're set up that day. Rice is unique in that he has that engine to be able to step into there when required, often alongside Jorginho in big games, but still get back up there as the eight. And Erdegaard's new role with more middle third responsibility means he's often stepping in there and build up himself when the game calls for it. As Arsenal's tactical and profile flexibility has increased this season, we don't need or want to make that 3-2 so often. And also when we do, our reliance on Zinchenko to do it has decreased. Zinchenko in the two or bust ball, as it felt sometimes last season, doesn't seem to be what we're doing. And also there's the other side to his game. The one we saw, ironically, nearly a year ago in that Anfield game. 
teams were targeting us down that side last season. It's a fact and it worked. And as I always say when critiquing the team, forget me, what do you think Arteta thinks? Look at this guy. He would sell his own children for three points. He just won't accept consistent mistakes down that side. Salah, the Wolves game at home, Madweke, Trent, and so on and so on. And so while it's not binary, doesn't mean he's out of the team, I suspect Zinchenko has lost a degree of trust from the manager. I don't know that, of course, but you get clues. Last year, he started pretty much every game he was available for. And this season, when fit and without Tomiyasu and Timber for the most part, he's barely been involved in some big games, especially recently against Porto and City. You can call it managing his minutes, but if Saka or Ben White can walk in a straight line, they play. So for me, that logic doesn't quite wash. Combine that with his injury record, with Tomiyasu's new contract and the lack of messaging around Zinchenko. I don't know, I get a vibe. Not to sound like a dating coach, but if Mikel wanted to, he would. There are, of course, games for Zinchenko. He isn't fourth choice in every game. In fact, against Luton, he was my first pick. So flexible, technical, progressive. When you've got a lot of the ball, he's great. But some types of games aren't now for Zinchenko. However, in that, we mustn't forget what he can do. And the important part now is maximizing that in the run-in. Can he make a big contribution towards the end of the season? Of course he can. Otherwise, this video wouldn't make any sense. Bournemouth at home, Everton at home. Give him the ball, let him express himself. Against Porto, I was screaming for Zinchenko from the stands. We were too horizontal, we lacked central penetration, and alongside Thomas Partey, he's one of our most vertical players. When the game calls for that, it's important we let Zinchenko find himself in the zones that he loves. The reason he made such a splash when he first came in is I genuinely believe there's not many players who are as comfortable receiving on the second line with their back to goal in world football. And he's also started to find more and more time on the right-hand side, offering us a flexibility that could be huge for finding variation in how we play. A game like Old Trafford, looking at the way United play with Rashford stood behind the opposition's centre-backs when they're building up, creating those huge distances, Zinchenko could absolutely cook. And that could be a game for him, considering Anthony's lack of threat. Should we call it that? Lack of threat. I don't want him away at Bayern or up against Cole Palmer. I think we've moved past that. But using Zinchenko wisely could be a big part of this running. Next up, Fabio Vieira. Probably the most forgotten of the three, but there is a time for Fabio Vieira in this run-in. So let's talk. I don't like doing, hate to say I told you so stuff on this channel. No, I do, I do. But I said I was worried about Vieira last July to many cookings at the time, and I think I was right to be. I bring that up slightly for my ego, yes, but mainly to make the point that I've had the concerns I'm about to say for quite a long time, and they haven't really changed. I said on a podcast the other day, and I back it, the difference between elite football players at City, Madrid, and so on, and good football players at Villa, Newcastle, etc., in my opinion, is much less about the margins of technical and athletic level than we think. The bigger margins for me at that level are in mentality and effectiveness. How do you deal with pressure? Do you rise or do you shrink? How do you deal with setbacks? Do you seize opportunities? Are you him? Obviously, Bellingham is also better technically than Jacob Ramsey, and Rice can run further than Joe Willock. I'm not saying that. But if you're a top-level footballer, you can trap a ball, you can play a pass, and you are physically fit. You wouldn't be in the Premier League if not. The bigger margins, as I see it, are somewhere else. For Vieira, I worry about those differences. I don't worry about his technical level. I don't worry if he's good enough ability-wise. And I don't even really worry about his athletic capacity or profile, as some do. I actually think he's a lot quicker than some people give him credit for. I worry... Can he affect games? Does he have that drive mentally to force his way into the team and make a difference? I don't like doing too much character projection because I literally don't know the guy and I'm not casting any aspersions on professionalism to be clear, this is a different thing. But do we think he's the type of character who will demand minutes, who will demand Mikel place him to be banging on the door saying, I can win this league title for you? I don't think he is from what I've seen. And that is okay. I mean, not everyone's like that. But when the pressure's highest in the run-in, Mikel will pick those guys. That all said, we know what he can do. I think back to that Fulham game, that final ball for Eddie Nketiah, even that ball to Jesus in the United game, and I wonder. After De Bruyne scored that goal against Palace on Saturday, I tweeted this, and my comments were flooded with replies about Fabio Vieira. We know he can do it. We know he has it in him. It's about showing it. But I have to say, I don't totally share the confidence of some of these replies. We just don't have the sample. I'm not saying he doesn't have the capacity. I'm saying we haven't seen it enough to be consistent. For Vieira, I think it's all about placement, timing in a game, sensing when a game might need a moment, the spaces are there for Vieira to occupy, particularly out wide and actually on the left for me. And that 
will be on Mikel to find. I'd love someone to ask Mikel about Vieira because even if he has played away at Brighton, we haven't seen him since the 45 minutes against Sheffield United over a month ago in any competition and he's been fit as far as we know. Let's not lose sight of him because I have a feeling a big moment for Fabio Vieira might be coming down the pipeline. And finally, Emile Smith-Rowe. Mikel was asked about Emile this week, specifically if he still sees him as a big part of the project. Mikel confirmed he did, then he said this. I look at him and what happened over the last two, three seasons. Take all that. It's the best thing that could have happened for him in his career if he uses it in the right way. Don't look back and say if, if. No, this happened. Use it. I had great moments. I had difficult moments. Now I know what I want, how to deal with it. That's going to make him a much better player. You can see the hell of a player we have in him when he's fit and he's playing at that level. I won't hide from it. This season, I've slightly written Emil off. However, against Luton, and let's pump the brakes slightly because of the opposition, but he showed an out-of-possession fight in that game I haven't seen up to that point. The interception for the goal and a few other moments on the edge of our box showed a growing effectiveness in all phases. Maybe written off is too strong, but I have such a laundry list of question marks around him that it was getting hard to see a path forward. I'm not saying he's answered all of them in one game, but I am saying I'm more open to seeing how his path progresses. There's no question about Smith Rowe's talent. Knock it around the corner, one, two, low socks, driver shot, overlap, combinations, lovely. You're not finding many better ball carriers. Top player. But to play in Mikel's team, we know you need more than that. You need to have the legs to defend in numbers and attack in numbers, press high and defend your box, affect games, stay compact, be up for the fight, win your duels, compete. And that controlled aggression side of Emil's game has always felt a little academy graduate. I suppose, to me. I think actually the way Emil arrived in some ways has hurt him. It set up these huge expectations that unless you're literally generational and have the most linear development possible a la Bukayo, when you're going through a bad spell, you've lost it. Whereas all I think we're seeing is the natural waves of player development, in this case, his body maturing. And also the way he arrived created this idea that Arteta should almost be grateful that he saved his job and therefore the idea that Smith Rowe might not be in the team much longer is just ridiculous. Which I think has slightly frozen our view of him in time. And I reject that view. Yes, he was incredible in that period, but that can't be the reason we pick him in 2024. And I think that narrative slightly fogs the view of him for some, because let's be clear, this is a player who has a lot to prove. However, if Emil could continue to show this new aspect to his game, an out of possession fight, let's call it, why can't he have a big say in this running? Because in terms of unique profiles, carrying through midfield, getting shots off in the box, receiving on the half turn high up in a block, we don't have that. And there's a space for that in the team, if his body can support him. There are games, moments, times, periods for Emil in this run-in, so let's not forget about him either. Special mentions for Reese Nelson and Urien Timber, who were unlucky not to make this list, by the way, but didn't for various reasons. Timber's best days will be next season, I think, though I think he can make some form of contribution this season. And Reese, though I praise the guy, I don't see a world where Reese makes significant contributions in the run-in. Ditto with Eddie. Maybe they do, but I think their races or Reese's at Arsenal are done, regardless of if they do or don't. But that is for another video. To be in this position, to have 16, 17, 18 players who are ready to make a contribution in this run-in is really important and not one that Arsenal have been in many times before. However, we won't stop there. Mikel has previously spoken about potentially increasing even the 25-man squad limit. And though I can't find the quote, so maybe someone can help me, I'm sure he recently actually named the amount of players he'd like in his squad that he can call on and rotate out with different strengths and weaknesses like Man City. Regardless, these conversations will continue because one thing is for sure, the first 11, as we knew it, if it ever did exist, is dead. If you like The Different Knock, you can support us on Patreon monthly or you can buy us a coffee.